Hi, I'm Brian Holders with Root Cause. Today we're in the Washington Park Arboretum in Seattle, Washington. We're going to look at some trees. One of the reasons that trees in cities or trees in the built environment sometimes struggle is that we rake up all the foliage that falls uh, from the trees. Now this is a native tree and, and it's uh, evergreen so it doesn't you know, it's not, there's, there's not a point where it drops all its leaves or needles, but it, it does drop uh, its needles, you know, over time. They die out and they fall, and, and in the forest, in the natural environment, the, all the debris falls and it stays at the base of the tree and it creates a spongy layer, protects the roots, helps retain moisture uh, for a tree, and it'll fall, all fall essentially within the drip line of the tree, meaning the, the, the edges of the canopy. In the city, right, in our backyard, maybe we got a tiny backyard, we typically rake that stuff up. We rake up leaves, we rake up needles, we want to have grass underneath there, we want a picnic table, whatever. That, that's a means of fighting against nature. So you can see, and you'll see around a lot of these trees, you'll see native trees, and, they're, and, and we to some extent have mimicked the native environment. This layer of organic material, wood chips or needles or uh, decomposing organic matter, that again helps retain moisture, helps, uh, helps protect the root system of the tree. What we often have in our landscapes, in our residential landscapes, is we have trees with grass growing right up to the edge of them. In an ideal scenario, a tree, the root zone of a tree, will get all the space underneath the canopy of the tree just for itself and, and, and minimal competition. Now, if natives grow, sometimes natives will grow like Salal will grow underneath a cedar tree, that's fine. But uh, a monoculture like turf grass growing right up to the edge of the tree over time can cause a lot of issues. Again, the tree root system wants its own space, just like a teenage kid wants his own bedroom, right? Pretend this is a teenage tree. This is an old man tree, or an old, old person tree, right? It wants its own space. So to the extent that we can give it its own space, let it have its root zone, protect its roots. Again, the, the arborist chips helps, helps retain moisture, helps protect the tree roots, and just helps the tree over time, it rejuvenates the soil. It just helps the tree thr thrive. But a lot of what you're gonna find in, in, in the Arboretum, uh, the Seattle Arboretum, is uh, plants that are native to the Northwest. Uh, this is a, a, an understory plant called Salal, that's the English. Typ it's a ground cover, and typically it grows like this. I mean, it just grows a footer's tall variety and it grows almost like a shrub. This is especially beautiful. And they really like to grow underneath cedar trees. Well, we got a hemlock there, but there's a couple of cedars behind, uh, native cedars behind it. So native cedar, western red cedar, and salal are, uh, what's the term? They have a synergistic relationship. They tend to like each other. And the salal likes to grow underneath the cedar tree. This is a myrtle. Wow, this is a total, there's three of them. This specimen is crepe myrtle. Uh, like I say, my Latin is escaping me today. This is, these are multi-stem crepe myrtle trees. The smooth bark, you can see the smooth uh, patterned bark. This is a crepe myrtle tree. It's just extremely common in landscapes and you'll often see it at the corner of, uh, the corners of commercial buildings or uh, you know, even, even houses. My father used, my father was a forester. It was a common term that my father liked to use because these trees were so often used in landscapes and were so often uh, pruned, over pruned in a topiary fashion, meaning this is a tree that is commonly shortened and they tried to make and people commonly, and still do, all these years later, try to make it into a hedge or make it, just shorten it, you know, and turn it into a sort of a bush. The term for that, process and my father loved to say that and he used to turn red in the face anytime he'd see it as he called crepe murder. Mm -hmm. Look at the crepe murder they did on those trees. This is a specimen tree. You can see it's just the, the the beauty of this bark is just something you don't see every day and if you can pan back you can see this tree is you know it can grow to be 30 to 40 feet tall. Uh, it's just you know again often they're over pruned and it's a beautiful specimen tree. 
the process of over pruning. We, in general, as arborists, is something we've known for decades, and it's number like the number one rule to call yourself a certified arborist is you know that topping trees is bad, right? Obviously, there are exceptions. There, crepe myrtle is a tree that is commonly topped in landscapes throughout the U.S. And uh, knowledgeable people refer to that process as crepe murder. It's a common practice of arborists and tree services. Is we get a lot of calls to do dead wooding, right? Take dead limbs out of a tree. In general, you know, one of the things that we have to do in, as arborists and in the profession is you're, you're always trying to balance the needs of the tree, the needs of nature, with the needs of the property owner, right? It's a, a, a general rule that I've said many, many times and will continue to say is that trees do not need us for anything. We need trees for a lot, for oxygen, for beautification, for shade, for screening between us and our neighbor, whatever. We need trees, but trees do not need us for anything, right? There's nothing that, the, that, that mankind contributes to the life of a tree. I mean, maybe planting it and helping it propagate, but once the tree's growing, it doesn't need us at all. It, uh, it, it does not, it, it, it's, a, it's a myth to say, well, that tree needs to be pruned. The tree doesn't need to be pruned for anything ever, right? We may want to prune it. We may think it's too tall. We may think it's growing into the roof or growing into the power lines or, you know, the roots are, you know, getting in my grass so I can't, or so my lawnmower gets bogged down on it. We may need to change the tree somehow, right? But a tree does not need us for anything. It is a common belief that a tree should be dead wooded. Right? You see dead limbs in a tree, take them out. Again, for the most part, there's nothing wrong with taking dead limbs out of a tree. You got a dead limb, I don't know, maybe if it's a bigger limb, maybe it's hanging over your kid's swing set, yeah, you're probably gonna take it out because you don't want little Junior to get bonked in the head by a falling limb one day, right? But the tree, tree sometimes kills its limbs. In fact, if you look closely at this, you can see, I'm not saying this tree killed its limb, but I am saying that unlike Unlike the human body, trees can compartmentalize decay. If you get an infection in your finger, right, your body will fight that infection. But if somehow uh, the body can't control the infection, you know, over time the infection will spread into your blood and can spread throughout your body and it can kill you. And a cut on your finger, if untreated under the right set of circumstances, can kill a person, right? Not so with a tree. Not so with a healthy tree, right? If a healthy tree has the ability to shut that off, compartmentalize the decay just to that one area, and if you can look, you can see how this, uh, you can see how this, 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 this uh, limb has formed a kerf uh, as, as a means of sort of sealing off that, that decay, stops it there, lets that part die, it sacrifices that part for the good of the tree. Well, guess what? The tree doesn't need us to take that off, right? The tree's already, Whatever, whatever ill effect this, this was going to have on the tree, the tree's taking care of it, right? It doesn't need us to remove that tree. In fact, this little bit of dead wood here and there's little bits of dead wood throughout the tree could be valuable to the tree. Why? Because the birds come along, insects come along. But let's say birds come along. They say, hmm, look at there. I'll break that off. I grab that with my beak. I break it off. I go make my nest with it. While I'm here, I'll eat the berries of this tree. I'll eat the fruit of this tree. And I'll take it over there. I'll drop it over there, you know, and make a new tree. So, tr so dead wood, while we may not like it in our landscape trees, we may not like the way it looks. We may think, hey, that's a hazard. Maybe, you know, not a little limb like this, but a bigger limb. We think, hey, that's a hazard that could fall and, you know, and, and, and cause damage or hurt somebody. We may take it off. But a tree does not need us to remove dead wood, ever. Again, this dead wood is valuable to the tree. Brings birds, brings insects, and uh, they help propagate the species. Uh, so what we got here, wow, listen to that. This is a tree that's decaying. That, that hollow sound is the sound of the bark. What was this, a hemlock? It's a hemlock or a fir, I can't even tell. It's so decayed, but uh, 
that holosan you hear is the sound of the, the bark. There's no, there's no uh, conductive tissue anymore. This tree's been dead a long time. And so the bark is just essentially sloughing off and that'll happen over the course of years and years. But I'm not, I'm not sure if this tree was dead or why they removed it. But this is something that we sometimes do in the, you know, in the urban landscape as well. They've done it here in the Arboretum is rather than taking the tree that was probably dead already, rather than taking it out complete, completely, they've just created a wildlife snag. Now this is an art form. They didn't really do a whole lot with this. The point of creating a wildlife snag is as I was mentioning earlier about dead wood, there is value in dead wood in the forest, right? Again, brings bugs in, bugs, there's all different types of bugs and insects that, uh, that contribute to the forest ecosystem. Um, as you can see, this tree stump was left at about 25 feet high and We'll use a chainsaw to make those cuts in the top to try to imitate it as if the uh, as if the as if the top or the rest of the tree just broke out. It's what it's supposed to look like. Um, but again, the point of leaving a wildlife snag is snag. A snag is a term that we use in a in a forestry a forestry a term that means a, a dead tree, right? Um, and so we leave a dead or a partial dead tree, right? You leave it say 25 feet tall. Try to make it look like it broke out. Sometimes we'll even go and you know cut slits in it. Um, it's hard to do. <laughs> I've tried to do it. It's hard to do. But uh, sometimes you'll put slits in it, what they call a bat slit, or if you make kind of a, a almost like a little cave in there, then it can attract you know whether it's bats or squirrels or some type of bird, other type of birds, or whatever. Um, but again, try to get leave all this decaying organic matter for wildlife rather than just cutting it up and taking it away. So uh, now we're gonna go over here and take a look at this, uh, at this uh, magnificent Douglas fir. Uh, it caught my attention because of the sap flow uh, coming out the side of the tree. It's something you see a lot with Douglas firs. So this is, this is sap. A sap is a tree's blood. Oh, and you'll see this, you'll see this, you see this somewhat commonly with Douglas fir trees. Typically, there's, there's, there's some sort of an injury where the sap starts. There was some sort of a crack in the, in the shell, inside the bark, in the, in, the, in the conductive layer, in the conductive tissue of the tree, there's some sort of a crack. Typically, this rotational injury to the tree, if you, if you pan back, you can see what we got here is a nice, fat, wide, healthy Douglas fir tree. Uh, and you got winds coming from multiple directions and the tree will, you know, will just twist. And, and they're, they're, they're very prone and susceptible to these conditions. And so, again, there's, there's some sort of a, an injury there that probably never fully heals because the next time a windstorm comes, it happens again. It's kind of like getting stitches and you never quite heal up and then you open that injury up again. And so this sap will probably flow permanently. Doesn't necessarily mean a weakness in the tree, doesn't mean there's any structural issues in the tree necessarily. You would, it's the kind of thing that if this were, you know, hanging over your house, you might want to have uh, tested once in a while. You might want to have an arborist come and check the stability of the tree or do a hazard rating on the tree. Um, but again, this is just an external sign of what in fact is a common injury. And in fact, if you come to this side, you can see there was one on this side also, but the, uh, but the, but the, it, it's, it's quite possible that it's healed itself because the, it's not running anymore. When you see them white like this, that means it's just fairly recently it was still running. And in fact, if you, if we touch this, you'll find, we'll find a couple of places where it's still wet. So this is probably, and especially now as spring is coming on, uh, it will, uh, it'll keep running. But this one conversely may have been a lesser injury that is, uh, that is somewhat healed itself. There it is. Picked up the leaf because it's 
this is a white oak leaf. There are numerous white oaks. There are red oaks, and then the general, see this is where somebody's probably gonna correct me. <laughs> the general uh, the difference is that red oak uh, has pointed lobes, uh, and the white oak leaf has rounded lobes. You don't see a whole lot of white oaks in Seattle. You'll see them in the Arboretum. In fact, this one's got a little sign on it. Ah, chestnut oak. You'd think I'd know this, being from Louisiana. Uh, Quercus, Quercus michosi. Native, as the sign says, to the southeast United States, including Louisiana. Probably Florida, Georgia also. Um, but yes, type of, type of a white oak. Again, not something you see here, so uh, not something I'd be able to, especially in the wintertime, that I would be necessarily be able to identify. But, you know, that's the, one of the beauties of going to your local arboretum is that you see a lot of trees and plants that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't see anywhere else. Wow, look what we got here. Let me see if I can figure out what, it's some type of a oak tree. Willow oak, okay. Quercus fellows, one of the narrow-leafed oaks, uh, kind of like a live oak. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is these braces. This is just not something you see very often. And it's, in all the years I've been in business, I have never deployed. Holy shit. <laughs> these are just giant braces, uh, must be, uh, must be made of steel. What is that, about uh, 20, 25 feet long? It's just a, some sort of a construction brace. The tree, I don't know, probably at some point, if you come around here starting to lean over, that's the first thing you look for. Is there a bulge on the backside? <laughs> because if a tree falls over, it, brings, it takes its root system with it, right? You know, this is the arboretum, right? And um, so they go to a great effort to keep trees growing, but this is, an interesting example because as you can see, this is a very large tree. It's leaning and it's target. I mean, when you try to determine if a tree is a hazard, the first question you ask is what's the target, right? If you've got a giant tree and you have some reason to believe that that tree could, is, you know, soil saturated, it's got root decay, whatever. If you have some reason to believe, so that's such that you're doing an investigation. If an arborist has some reason to believe the tree could fail, in whole or in part, meaning uproot or break in half or whatever. And you get a call to say, hey, um, I'm worried about this tree. I wanna know if this tree is a hazard. Question number one, even before you start to look at like, how could it fail or do we have any reason to think it could fail? Question number one is what's the target? You know, And if the target is a whole freaking forest, right? The tree's gonna fall, but all it's gonna do is, you know, squash a bug or whatever. No, it's not a hazard. Now, if you're, you know, if, you, if it's out in the woods and, you know, this is a campsite, people bring their tents or RVs or whatever, and they're out there, uh, you know, every weekend all summer, well, you might consider that a high, you know, a high, a high hazard or a, a high target value. Now, this is really interesting because if, if you look from over here, you can see where a giant limb blew out of it. I mean, that was probably a foot and a half in diameter. Look at this thing, man. It's not a specimen of beauty. Now, in God's eyes, it's beautiful. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's nature, right? But this is not what you look at and think, oh, wow, what a beautiful tree. You think it's gnarly. It's got broken limbs, it's got cavities in it. It's just kind of ugly, right? But still, it's here, right? It's 80 years old, 100 years old, whatever, right? Why, 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 why get rid of it? And the fact that, that, that a tree that's clearly uprooting and clearly as a potential failure the reason that, that we leave it here i mean they can cut this thing down in four hours right but we leave it here and i don't i mean I'm, it's still here because we have a method in place to keep it from falling over that will keep it upright now it could still die right and still big chunks could still blow out of it but the tree, that will keep it, those things work, is what I'm trying to say. And, and in fact, if you look at this one, you can see that when this was installed, and again, I don't know when it was, likely the same is true with, the, with, the, uh, with that one. But when this was installed, they put this thing in, poured 
poured a little concrete base on it, you know, to help spread the, uh, to help spread the load. And this thing is what's keeping the tree upright. The other one is, you know, is not. If we could somehow get that out of there, which I don't recommend, it's quite possible the tree would fail. And the, ne the next time though, the saw became saturated and the wind came from that direction. So I say we don't do that. I wanted to show you this growing out of the trunk of this tree. Sign here, but we can't read it anymore. This is uh, caused by a fungus. When you see this type of a branching pattern, it's sometimes it grows straight out of the trunk of the tree. Sometimes, probably more often, it'll grow in the, in the canopy. This is something we call witch's broom. Uh, again, something that's caused by a fungus. There's really no cure for it. Sometimes we can cut it out of a tree and it won't come back, but it's just, it's a fungus that causes that sort of a crazy overgrowth. Again, it's just, it's something that happens in nature and this is the arboretum, so. And as I said before, trees don't need us for anything, right? There are ways that we as, as, as humans can help trees or help, you know, help improve the life of a tree. Uh, but they really don't need us. And they don't need us to solve this witch's broom, so. If you have any questions about your trees or any questions about trees at all, reach out to us at rootcauseseattle.com.